It sounds like a cliché. Chinese kids playing piano. But for me, I started learning in grade one and practiced constantly for 10 years after that. In between violin lessons, of course. Still got it. And, of course, I'm not the only piano prodigy among the diaspora. I started piano uh, at the age of six. It was kind of like a phenomenon in, in China because uh, parents tend to take their children to instrumental lessons at a very young age. Andy Deng recently graduated from the Conservatorium of Music in Sydney, but he grew up in Chengdu, where he took his lessons very seriously, practicing three to four hours a day. Part of the reason parents take their kids to piano lessons uh, is for competition. When you go to a school, in a class there are so many students, like uh, 40 or 50 students, so, and parents will always uh, talk to each other when they're at school picking up their kids, saying like, ah, oh, uh, my kids just passed to piano grade 8, and how about your kid? Piano has a long history came to China. You know, we, uh, we can go back to 1601 when the missionaries come to Beijing to, uh, to see the emperor, right? So then they brought the emperor some gifts. And one of the gifts is called clavichord. Clavichord is like a keyboard instrument. And I would say from there on, um, the Ming emperor and later the Qing, the different opera emperors in Qing, just fascinated by Western music. One, two, three. Jin Dong Tai is the director of the US China Music Institute and professor of music at Bard College in New York. He grew up during the Cultural Revolution. When the Cultural Revolution started, you know, basically anything foreign, anything old, were forbidden. It was one day my best friend and called me. He said, Jin Dong, it's come to my home. I want to show you something. And he lowered the curtain because he doesn't want didn't want anyone to know what we were doing. And then he showed me this gramophone machine. So that's my first time listening to a Beethoven symphony. It's uh, made the lasting uh, impression on me. At the time, instruments like the piano were symbols of Western ideals. In fact, it's been reported that Chairman Mao's wife, Jiang Qing, described them as black boxes in which the notes rattled about like the bones of the bourgeoisie. But things changed when local musicians found a way to keep the Communist Party happy. So this pianist in Chengzong, he played revolutionary songs on the piano. And he even took the piano onto Tiananmen Square to play. And that re really made lots of curiosity for people, say, wow, look at this. And the pianist are playing the, the revolutionary song. Then that's, you know, he demonstrated to say, okay, uh, this is just an instrument. An instrument can serve the revolutionary purpose. And just like Western instruments have found a home inside China, traditional Chinese instruments have found a home outside the country, becoming a popular way for the diaspora to reconnect with their culture. You might have seen Wei Shan Shen busking on the banks of the Yarra at some point over the past decade. Everyone like knows who my grandpa is, which is like quite amazing. So like, if I mention like this two-string Chinese instrument, they're always like, oh my God, it's always that guy. That instrument is the Erhu or Chinese violin, and it's a skill he picked up while working in a factory in Shanghai. It was his granddaughter who reignited his passion for playing when she asked him to teach her.
我是我有我是有一个有一个身份在这里，我是中国人，我做事情应该要做的认真一点，要做的好一点。While music is encouraged as an extracurricular activity, it might take a while for parents to accept it as a career path. Chinese parents, particularly, ask your kids to play the violin, play the piano, but when you choose career, they will say, "Don't go to music." Thankfully, I became a comedian rather than a musician, so my parents have nothing to worry about. <laughs>